Um, yeah, so thanks everybody for coming bright and early. Good morning. Um, yeah, so today may be a little bit of an adventure. Uh, PowerPoint decided this morning it didn't like my presentation and wanted to corrupt all of my slides. So let's have some fun. Um, I'm going to be talking today uh, a little bit about um, all the different things you can do with cannabis testing in LCM SMS. Um, the, the biggest thing we usually focus on is pesticide testing, um, but after a while talking about that can be a little bit boring. Um, so I'm going to spend about, oh, my mic's not on. I will turn that on. I'm usually pretty loud enough that I don't need one. Is that better? Okay, cool. Sweet. So. Like I was saying, pesticide testing is extremely important and probably the most challenging part of, uh, of cannabis testing. So I definitely will touch on that. Uh, but then I'm going to spend about the second half talking about some of the auxiliary testing you can do in, in, in cannabis and, and some of the fun you can have uh, in doing that analysis. So um, in the U.S., the, the current state of cannabis is continuously in flux. Uh, as new states come online in terms of regulation uh, of the product itself, they also come online in terms of how it's regulated from uh, a testing standpoint. So uh, as a new state comes online, they set new testing requirements. And these are really important because as this, uh, as this commodity, as it's becoming, start, continues to grow, uh, there may be some foul play in terms of trying to increase crop yields. So we need to really keep this product safe for, for consumers. Um, Oregon was the first to come online in terms of creating a, a comprehensive testing portfolio for, for pesticides. Uh, although Colorado was the first to come online in terms of legalization in the US, um, the, the rules around pesticide testing weren't very stringent. And, and Oregon kind of set the standard. They um, dictated uh, 59 pesticides uh, down to about 100 parts per billion in the flour that need to be tested for in order for this product to pass. Um, and so from there, SIAX developed something called a V method. And it was a full-on SOP right from uh, acquisition and sample prep all the way to you know, having a report template. So that if you wanted to get set up, it takes you a matter of weeks rather than months. And this is kind of where it all started with SIAX. Um, we had some really nice chromatography uh, using a connect biphenyl column, which is really nice selectivity for, for cannabis applications. A little bit different orthogonal selectivity than traditional C18 and gives you really good separation regions with um, high interferences. So uh, this is kind of where we started to build our methods. Uh, but then California came online and said, ho, ho, hold on. We're going to add a few more pesticides. We're going to make it a little more challenging. Specifically, we're going to add some compounds that aren't amenable to electrospray and a lot more compounds that are traditionally done by GCMS and set the limits a little bit lower. So we go back to the drawing board and we create a new method that you know is a little more APCI heavy. So Compounds that aren't electric spray minimal traditionally are done by GCMS, but there's also something called APCI, uh, atmospheric pressure chemical ionization, that allows you to ionize things that don't have traditionally ionizable groups, like hydroxyl groups or carboxylic acids for deprotonation or amines uh, for protonation. So things like pentachloronitrobenzene, that is an aromatic ring with five chlorines in a nitro group. You can't pull a proton or put on a proton when there is no proton to, to handle. Um, and same, same thing with chlorine, heavily chlorinated pesticides. We can leverage the power of uh, and the selectivity of negative mode APCI um, to ionize these compounds, get really low background, and, and still detect these at the required levels. And then the guys north of the border, um, where I'm from, I am Canadian, uh, just like the old, I guess you wouldn't see those commercials, never mind. <laughs> um, Candace said, hold on, hold on, hold on. 100 parts per billion? No, no, no. 65 compounds? No. Uh, Health Canada is regulating 96 pesticides at limits 10 to 20 to 40 times lower than Oregon and California. Uh, Canada, Canada is really trying to take a leadership role in cannabis. Um, it is now federally legal across the country as of October of last year. And uh, they regulate right now for fresh flower um, dried flour and, and oil products, but uh, in the new year it'll be regulated for edibles and all, all the uh, all the auxiliary matrices. Um, and there's rumors of expanding this um, expanding this pesticide list to the full food list because at this uh, once edibles start to come online, it's now become a food commodity. Uh, the pesticide testing may require 300 pesticides, the full uh, Canada Food Inspection Agency. So 
we really have to be flexible in how we're moving forward and, and, and have the proper equipment to do so. These are some of the new compounds that Canada introduced that haven't been on any U.S. list um, and kind of use these uh, signals to see anything with that play button. It's things that are commonly analyzed by GCMS uh, don't necessarily need to be analyzed by GCMS. And you have a few more of these compounds that simply don't ionize by electrospray. Again, these heavily chlorinated um, organochlorine pesticides, this compound etradiazole doesn't really like to uh, go by electrospray. So uh, what we had, uh, had to do is then take a look at what the requirements are. And unfortunately, uh, this came into effect as of January 2nd. Uh, 2019, and these are the regulations in terms of the limits uh, for all the different pesticides and all the different matrices. All these red boxes are where um, Health Canada still hasn't put a number yet. Um, this hasn't changed. It's now June. Um, so you can see how difficult this analysis is because Health Canada is the one who's you know, kind of developing methods so we can set these limits and what are the analytical challenge. They're really struggling, uh, as you can tell. So really, this is, this is a difficult problem to solve. Cannabis is not a regular food commodity uh, in terms of the way you analyze it because there's a, a whole ton of matrix interferences, a huge, um, uh, huge amount of ion suppression capability. Um, it's just the really the dirtiest, nastiest matrix we've ever seen. But uh, what we were able to do is actually use, um, we tried a different column phase for this application, um, a Luna Megapolar C18. Um, to do some chromatography uh, for uh, a large electrospray panel to hit the low-level detection requirements for the vast majority of the compounds um, on that candle list, and then a really small APCI panel, basically to, 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 ion, uh, to analyze all those compounds that basically won't ionize by electrospray, but also uh, for those compounds that actually work better by APCI. So there's things like chlorphenopure, um, parathine methyl, Work, they can be analyzed by electrospray, but they work better by APCI. But, so if we're going to do APCI anyway, might as well throw those over there. So we had like a, about a 15 or 20 minute method in, in electrospray and a second injection that was five or 10 minutes, uh, depending on how you do that chromatography and APCI. Um, what's really important is the way we do that extraction. And so uh, I believe one of the reasons Health Canada is struggling to reach all those limits um, is not necessarily in terms of their analysis, and from their chromatography standpoint, it's from their extraction protocol. So if you look in the Journal of AOAC, Health Canada published a method, and it involves about 12 different sample cleanup steps, seven blowdowns, and three different solvent exchanges. Um, with a matrix as complex as cannabis and uh, an analyte panel as diverse as the 96 that they've proposed, as soon as you start to increase, add in uh, sample cleanup steps, you're going to start to lose analytes. That's just the way it's going to be. Um, you have a vast range of, of chemical properties for these compounds, so um, anytime you try to do some type of solid phase extraction, uh, you're going to have a wide variety of extraction efficiencies. Yes? I'm sorry, are you talking about they have a standardized test for the reading? So it's, uh, it's a proposed method. Okay. Yeah, it's not the test you have to use. It's their recommended method, but it won't hit an, the whole list. So I don't know how good a recommended me method is that doesn't work. Um, that being said, uh, I will say that they are developing the method uh, on the LC side uh, using one of our instruments, uh, our SAG 6500 Plus, and I'll talk about that very briefly. Um, so the way we kind of um, follow uh, in terms of sample prep is to simplify that sample prep and leverage instrument sensitivity and instrument robustness in order to handle the matrix. So uh, basically we do a one in 10 extraction sonicate um, and do basically a, almost a physical removal where we're, we'll put our extracts in the freezer. Um, the, a lot of the high concentration fats and waxes will solidify out and while it's still cold we'll take an aliquot into um, an LC vial and then inject a small small injection volume. So basically what's really nice about this is this is a simple solvent extraction and you can use that same extract and you know, dilute it if you have to for other auxiliary compound classes. You don't have to do multiple extractions if you want to do a potency test or if you want to analyze for terpenes or if you want to analyze for mycotoxins. They can all come out of the same extract because we haven't differentiated along the way in terms of extraction. So uh, like I said, um, the analysis um, and some of the data that I'm gonna show you here has been acquired on a SAC 6500 plus Q-trap system. 
Um, this is our high end, uh, our highest end nominal mass system, if you're unfamiliar. And some of the technology that allows it to get there is the ion drive technology that was updated uh, on the system. Won't get into a huge amount of detail, but we have an ion drive source that basically creates more ions by optimizing uh, the, the uh, heat output from our Turbo V heaters. So basically you generate, uh, you desolvate with much higher degree of efficiency and it's more robust against fluctuations from coming from solvent matrices. So it's a little more uh, tolerable to matrix effects than uh, our previous sources. So because we are generating more ions, we need to be able to capture more ions. And so we improve, improved our Q-Jet and this is a dual stage Q-Jet. So where uh, most of our competitors will have something like a heated capillary that will clog probably after about 30 or 40 cannabis samples. Um, we have something called a Q-Jet, and this is probably my favorite piece, on, my favorite component of our mass spectrometers. This is the component that allows us to, to do what we do. Um, it is hugely efficient in terms of ion capture. It's extremely efficient in terms of neutral removal and, uh, and, and uh, liquid droplet, micro droplet removal. So we're able to increase the orifice size in our mass spectrometers to increase the sensitivity, but still maintain the robustness. And the one of the most beautiful things about this QJet ion guide is that it's on axis. So for our competitors that don't have heated capillaries, they will generally have an off axis movement, a turn around a corner um, using a set of lenses to remove their neutrals. The problem with that is as soon as a lens gets a little bit of ion burn, your ion transmission goes through the floor. When this is dirty, it still works. And you can clean this yourself. It's not that hard. Then so and finally, uh, we improved our detector at the, uh, at the back end to increase the linear dynamic range. And in terms of sensitivity, um, we did not sacrifice um, that, lin that linear dynamic range, range for improved sensitivity. So at this point, we're basically counting ions at the detector and we're reaching a critical limit in terms of detector technology. And because this is a pulse counting detector, um, it maintains accuracy and precision down at low ion counts. This is not an analog detector that you know, gets better in terms of precision and accuracy as you get more ion counts. This is counting pulses. So you get good accuracy and precision where it counts. Not when a compound is 10,000 ppm, you need to know whether it's 10,000 ppm or 10,001. You need to know whether it's 10 ppb or 11 ppb, and that's where this, really, this detector really shines. So, some examples of some data. The easy stuff, classical electrospray compounds that are on the Health Canada list. You can see, um, looking at the matrix blank that we did some extractions on, a nice clean matrix blank, so you get nice selectivity from the MRMs that we've chosen. 10 part per billion cal, you're looking at 30,000 counts, 100,000 counts, really great signal to noise in your cal, and the matrix looks the same and you see great linearity for both of these compounds. These are the easy ones. A Couple more easy ones, carbofuran, bupropazine. No problem, excellent signal to noise, down at or below the Health Canada required limits. Boring stuff. What about compounds that are traditionally analyzed by GCMS or GCMSMS? Delta methrin, regulated at 12 and a half ppm. I think this has changed on the newest draft list to under development because they're still having problems with it. We can see it down to about 100 ppb in the matrix at an LOQ, maybe 10, 20 ppb in the matrix um, as, as an LOD. Endosulfan sulfate, again, regulated at one part per million. We can see it 100 fold lower in the matrix. So again, we're leveraging our instrument sensitivity, don't have to do as much cleanup because we can dilute out a, a lot of that matrix effect. So what about compounds that are not amenable to lecture spray for those that we have to do by APCI? These are the four major ones that we have to do by APCI that simply aren't amenable to lecture spray. And again, because a lot of these are run in lecture spray negative, uh, sorry, excuse me, APCI negative mode, um, not a lot of compounds will ionize in APCI negative mode, um, and particularly hydrocarbon-based compounds simply don't, and the vast majority of matrix interferences don't have halogens on them. Those are the anthropogenic compounds. Um, these all have some type of halogen associated with them, I believe so, I think, um, I think uh, etradiazole does. Um, but they do all light up in uh, APCI negative mode. The, the um, blanks and the baselines are in the tens of counts, 
um, and you get excellent signal noise at or below the required levels. But what if you need a little bit more? So you'd think, it doesn't matter what instrument vendor you go with, you get a triple quad, it's going to have the same selectivity, MRMs or MRMs. But that's not true when your triple can be a trap. So 80% of our customers choose to have a Q-trap as their Q3, a Q-trap model of our, of our nominal mass systems. And that's because, one, uh, it won't improve your overall uh, raw sensitivity, but it allows you for an additional flexibility when you need it. So it allows for uh, ultra-fast scanning speeds, um, where you can do independent, uh, information dependent analysis to get triggered product ion scans. I talked a little about this yesterday if you were here. Um, you get a little bit of improved mass resolution, um, an ability to trap all product ions and refragment them uh, on the chromatographic time scale. So this is what I'm going to be focusing on here is doing something called MRM cubed or MS cubed. So in cases where you have a matrix that has a huge degree uh, of, of matrix interferences, you can cut through that noise. So when we went from single quads to triple quads, we cut through hu hu a huge amount of background to improve our LODs um, and LOQs. But now we're doing this again to, to take it further when we need to. So um, how does this work? So in, in traditional MRM analysis, you'll, you'll uh, isolate an ion in Q1, you'll fragment it in Q2, you'll see all your fragments. And then in Q3, you would generally just isolate a, a, a fragment in Q3 and scan that through the detector. But what the Q-trap allows you to do is trap all of those fragment ions. You can then isolate one of those fragments, selectively refragment it, and scan out the secondary uh, fragment ions. What does this look like in practice? Pyrethrins are one of the most difficult analytes to analyze in cannabis because there's a huge amount of matrix interferences on basically all of the MRM channels. Uh, anytime you see a pyrethrin hit in uh, your cannabis samples, double check it and triple check it. Probably run it orthogonally on a different column. I would highly recommend. But what you can also do is use MRM cube to completely cut out the background. That's another way to do it. So instead of running something twice, you can run it once with MRM cubed. Um, cyflutherin, um, is anybody here uh, doing any testing in Massachusetts? Okay, so Massachusetts regulates cyflutherin down to 10 part per billion in the matrix, um, but they only regulate for eight other compounds. So the way, traditional way that uh, labs in Massachusetts are testing, they're doing eight compounds by electrospray and one compound by GC to hit that detection limit. Uh, right now we're the only LCMS vendor that can hit cyflutherin down to 10 ppb using the power of the Q-trap to cut through all that matrix. The backgrounds are completely clean. So that's all about pesticides. Um, actually, I'll take questions now about pesticides um, before we go any further. If not, we can, we can chat about it at the end as well. Well, no, I'll keep moving forward. Potency testing. Also required testing for, for label purposes and before product can be released for consumption. Um, so current regulations are required uh, to analyze for total uh, THC and CBD content. So that's the sum of THC, uh, THCA and the sum of CBD and CBDA. Uh, but most labs will also analyze for the lower abundant uh, cannabinoids, CBG, CBN, CBC, all the, and go, all the acronyms going forward. One of the challenges for this analysis is that concentrations can vary among these analytes from greater than 90% by weight for things like um, cannabis oil products and concentrates. So they're hugely concentrated in THC and or CBD, but the concentrations of these minor cannabinoids can be orders of magnitude lower. So trying to analyze these in, in one injection in, in traditional analysis is very difficult. This, so this is not necessarily a, a challenge analysis from a detection standpoint because the concentrations are very high. So this is commonly performed by LCUV. Um, these concentrations are in the percent level rather than the part per billion level. But the UV just simply doesn't have the linear dynamic range to go over five or six orders of magnitude. Um, so what can we do? We can develop some strategies. Um, so you can do this also by mass spectrometry, but again, uh, getting the high and low abundance can be a challenge, um, especially for electrospray. 
um, once you get at really high concentrations, when you, you're injecting uh, complex at part per million after you've done some dilution, you're gonna see some slur saturation, and that's just the nature of electrospray. But APCI uh, is another way you can ionize these cannabinoids, um, and it's much less prone to slur saturation. So you can increase your high end linear dynamic range simply by moving over to APCI. But what you can also do is use multiple different transitions for different linear portions of the curve. So at the low end of your curve, you can use really sensitive transitions, really um, things that fragment really well and give you great signal. But at the high end of the curve to prevent detector saturation, you can use less abundant transitions. And you can write queries inside the software or, or custom calculations in order to choose which portion and which, um, which, which transition to use in which portion of the curve. So you can kind of follow the solution flow chart where analyze the entire concentration range with one MRM. Can you get the full linear dynamic range? If yes, you're done. That's cool. Easy case. Um, if that doesn't work, maybe you'll use one MRM for high end, like I talked about, and one MRM for the low end. Can you get there? Oh. If yes, great. If not, you can start to detune uh, some of these transitions. So um, it's always great to work at the most optimum collision energy and the most optimum clustering potential, but if you're still saturating at the high end, there's no need to. You can move to a less optimum collision energy to reduce the ion trans transmission to the detector and again, prevent detector saturation. And so these three things combined are allow you to get the full linear dynamic range that you need. So some examples, for example, for THC, uh, in the vial, 10 to 30,000 ppb, uh, which after our dilution calculates to 0.3 to 90% in the sample, 0.999 R squared throughout the entire range. That's the easy case. One MRM transition does the whole range. Second case, THCA, it's acidic analog, negative mode. Actually, this is done in positive mode of APCI, electrospray negative mode. We use one transition from 10 to 10,000 ppb in the vial, so 0.3 to 30%. So basically, the range of flower concentrations can all be covered by, uh, by one, uh, one MRM transition. And then you can cover the really high range with another transition. Um, case number three, where detuning is required, these, these cannabidiol variants. Um, we, uh, for the way they fragment, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, at an optimized collision energy and decussing potentials, didn't matter which transition I looked at, it would saturate at the high end. Um, so in this case, I would take the, those transitions and maybe have a secondary one where they're detuned. But um, what's really nice to know is that for the, all the uh, cannabinoids that I was monitoring, these are the only ones that kind of saturated the high end and didn't have, um, didn't have two transitions that would cover the whole space. But um, these uh, can, uh, cannabinoids are never above 1% in any of the matrices. So you'll never see, um, you'll never see a, 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 comp, uh, a sample that has uh, a concentration up here. <laughs> so um, what we've also done is develop techniques to couple uh, LCUV analysis and mass spectrometry. So for the, uh, if you put an LCUV in line, you can use that to calculate and, and analyze for your high abundant cannabinoids like THCA, CBDA, uh, THC, CBD, and then use the mass spec the more sensitive technique to an analyze the low abundance of uh, cannabinoids in one injection. That's another technique we've used. Um, and what I was gonna show on the previous slide is how we can make this a whole lot faster. Um, so the thing about THC, CBD, and, and in particular CBC, they're all isomeric, and um, they're all isomeric, and they fragment nearly identically. All their transitions are all the same. Their, their product ion spectrum are the same. So we can't tighten up the chromatography, we need to separate these. But what if there's another way to separate these compounds? And what I would show on this slide is that we were able to separate these using differential ion mobility. So you have the potential to directly inject these compounds without chromatography and separate them in real time using differential ion mobility. This won't work um, with traditional ion mobility because the separation required the use of a solvent modifier that's unique to our, our or separation technique in terms of differential ion mobility um, in order to separate these compounds. And you may have heard we've released a technology here at ASMS. If you wanted to do this really, really, really fast, coupling uh, the differential ion mobility front end with uh, the ECHO MS um, that will be released early next year, you can do three samples per second. So you can imagine the, the, the capabilities of of, of a lab where you're, now you're lipi, lip, limited by how fast you can fill up your well plates, not by how fast your chromatography is. 
you can basically do a, a one second potency test. And that's the potential. So that was that slide. <laughs> so uh, finally, I'm going to talk about uh, terpenes. So uh, terpenes are the uh, flavor and aroma compounds inside uh, of the cannabis product. Um, and they, consumers and, and, and cannabis aficionados, if you will, um, have long asserted that the differences that come from strains are not just from the cannabinoid profile, but from how this product smells, how this product tastes, and their overall experience. I mean, drinking wine is not just about how drunk you can get. It's about experiencing that bottle of wine. Cannabis is the exact same way. And the, the, the vast majority of that comes from the terpene profile. So historical classifications, um, there's been all of these names, you know, you've heard of indica, sativa, and these hybrids, but what we're finding out more and more is that these designations don't really matter. These are coming from genotypes, um, the, the genomics of the seed, um, but we're finding out more and more that that's not really important. These, these, um, these crops have been so interbred over the course of the last century that there is no designation between this. It's all about um, how, the comp how these uh, plants are grown and what they express. So there's been this introduction of how uh, we're looking at the chemistry of the expression rather than the genotype. So we're looking at something called uh, um, chemovars instead of cultivars. Okay. Um, and we can see that bio biochemical markers, um, they can be they can explain these, these differences really nicely in, in cannabis varieties. So there's a paper that came out a, a couple of years ago. They did a targeted detection of 44 um, terpenes and cannabinoids and plotted them in, in PCA space and used multivariate data to now differentiate between strains. Not, you know, this guy says, I have the greatest OG Kush, and this other guy on the East Coast says, no, 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 I have the greatest OG Kush. We can actually measure what they express, not what the genotype is. So you can change the cannabinoid profile and change the terpene profile by simply shaking the plant. Um, what they'll do is, uh, what cannabis will do is when it's stressed out, it will generate more THC. But all of these will come from uh, similar cannabinoids. They all differentiate from the same structure. So when you increase your THC by stressing out uh, your plant, you'll decrease your CBD because they, all, they both come from CBG. So it can only go one up, one up comes one down. And the same thing can happen with these terpenes. They're all synthesized from the same starting molecules. So that analysis, that multivariate analysis was done using a targeted approach. They looked for 44 known cannabinoids and terpenes. But we know that there are hundreds of cannabinoids and terpenes that we know of in this cannabis product. So what if we did the same type of work in a non-targeted fashion? So using APCI, because we know that it will ionize endogenous compounds like terpenes and cannabinoids, we can do uh, some non-targeted approach um, with, that is greater than a short list of targets. So we used our X500 QTOF system and SWOTH data analysis to non-targetly acquire um, information across multiple different cannabis strains. So what is SWOTH acquisition? This is a way to get MSMS of everything. So in the traditional SWOTH analysis, what you would do is, um, instead of you know, using an information-dependent acquisition where you would look at your uh, full scan spectrum, pick the top five peaks in that survey spectrum and send those for MSMS analysis, here, you would open up your quadrupole to maybe say 25 Daltons and look between 100 and 125 Daltons and send all of those to your fragmentation pattern and get fragmentation spectrum for all of those compounds. Then you move to the next 25 Daltons, 125, 150, and get your fragmentation for all those compounds, 150, 175. And step that quadrupole all the way through the mass range. And now you can do this on the chromatographic timescale. You do step through the entire mass range throughout every cycle, so you get MSMS of everything. <coughs> and so what it, you get continuous and quantitative true collision dissociation of everything. The one drawback is that your, your, your product ion spectrum can be a little less selective because you've opened up your quadruple to 25 Daltons, but this is generally not an issue if you have any decent type of chromatography, um, or any, any chromatography really, and um, software is able to deconvolute spectrum spectra really, really well.
if necessary. So in terms of how we approach this analysis, so first we use some statistical tools. We, we acquired the data, have software non-targetly pick features. We're not telling the software what to look for, we just say, look for stuff that's in there. Then we use a uh, software called MarkerView to identify which features are most important. We can then build a peak list of, inter of interesting features that are different or the same <coughs> among strains. You can import that peak list into analytics inside of SciXOS. And then you can search for MSMS identification only of the features that are important or differentiating. And then from probable formulas, if you have in cases where you can't find MSMS library hits of compounds that are known, you can uh, find probable formulas for based on their high res accurate mass, search databases like ChemSpider that will propose formulas, maybe predict fragmentation patterns, and then can, you can choose candidates and then go back and reinterrogate and to find potential structures for these things that maybe nobody's ever seen before. So what does this look like in practice? Plug all your peak lists, or you have the software pick peaks for you, uh, plug that into our market view software, and you can see that all the different strains that we are analyzing for this, Negro Bonita, Gorilla Glue, um, double, double Sour OG, they cluster together, and that's what we'd expect. That's, you know, if they didn't cluster together, then you know there was something wrong either with the analysis or the crop growth. Um, and then you can look at the differentiating features. So you can see in this, in this uh, PC1 loading region, this is really differentiating this Negro Bonita and the, the Nepal chap. And up here, we can look at these features that are differentiating these particular, um, these particular strains. And you can look at multiple different um, PCA uh, levels. Um, again, you can look at the differentiating features in, in the different PC, PC loading plots. So when we dive into this data, we can look at these distinguishing features and we can see um, whatever this compound happens to be is upregulated in this Negra Bonita strain. Over here, we can see this is up, this, whatever this, these compounds are upregulated in Sour Star, OG Bravo, Campita. Um, and you see things that are downregulated in certain strains. And so we can go through um, and also look at t-tests rather than PCA plots and look at features that have a really large fold change uh, versus various different uh, sample sets and a really strong p-value. So they differ greatly and they differ greatly with a high degree of statistical significance. And then we can see, okay, this, whatever this compounds or these compounds are, are again upregulated in this Negroponita strain. So then we can build a, a short list of features that may or may not be important. And from there, we can start to identify them. So we plug those features into analytics and start doing some library searching. So peak interest number seven um, was simply CBN. So a minor cannabinoid that was differentiating the string among all the others. CBC differentiated the Campita, Sour Star, and OG Bravo. And we did this without telling it what to look for. Third one, um, this library, we had a library match for this Xanthorazole not a terpene that we commonly look for or targeted GC methods even look for. But we see that um, this was uh, downregulated in the Nepal strain. Um, and you still, for all of these, you're getting excellent MS1 matches in terms of their mass error. But what's really important is getting great matches in terms of their MSMS. And with SWATH, you can see that these MS, MSMSs, uh, MSMS spectra are exceptionally clean and you're getting excellent library scores. But what about for compounds that need a little more digging into? So for example, this, this particular feature, this, uh, it was mass, mass 343 with this particular fragmentation pattern was not uh, hit in terms of which libraries we searched. And so I should point out that we did also search the NIST MSMS library is where we get a lot of these hits that contain 17,000 compounds um, of largely um, natural products. But what we do get is a proposed formula for this based not only on mass error, but isotope ratio as well. So we got a peak interest as number six with no MSMS library match. What do we do? We can directly search the ChemSpider database. And while we search that ChemSpider database, we can do fragmentation pattern prediction at the same time. So if we look down here, we can see this proposed structure matches five of the seven peaks in its MSMS spectrum. 
um, and 86% of the total intensity. And it turns out that the only two peaks that didn't match were isotope peaks. So a lot of the spectra that are, that are predicted here are only based if you isolate your, uh, your uh, monoisotopic mass. But because SWATH has a wider window, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll extract your monoisotopic mass and its isotope, so you'll see the isotope peaks in the MSMS pattern, and those are the peaks that didn't get matched. So you have a, a, a certain degree of confidence. Now, this is a predicted MSMS fragmentation pattern um, and not from, from a true standard, but this gives you a direction in which to look. You don't have just a formula. And in, uh, there's 526 proposed structures uh, for that particular formula alone. And this is myrosinic acid, myrosinoic acid, excuse me. We can then take this and look at um, the mass accuracy of the fragments uh, from predicted structures as well. Um, look at the MS1 information and how it would overlay with theoretical if it was, if it was that uh, particular uh, structure and then overlay the proposed, uh, sorry, the, um, the experimental MSMS and assign formula to um, those MSMS fragments to ensure that they can indeed come from that particular structure and the mass error of those fragments. And you can see they're, they're really nice and tight. So again, this is done using just by importing a mole file of this myrosinic acid. So um, why didn't I just, just do some library, uh, do some peak picking and then search everything? Why am I doing the statistical analysis first? Um, this, would what be the, this would be the peak list uh, in terms of if I just did the library search straight up. And you can see there's, um, this is filtered, only things that had a library hit, but there are um, 3,500 features and 765 with, with at least some, some semblance of a library hit. So instead of having to brute force thousands of hits and figure out what's important, um, we, we don't necessarily need all of these. You can see a lot of them are, or these cannabigerol CBG that, that weren't important by these PCA loading plots. But we can classify and distinguish the difference that matter first and then streamline an our analysis later on. Now you can do it in both directions and, and look at the hits first and plug those into Mark Review to do the statistical analysis. But that is more, um, that's a very brute force, but we can, we can be smart about our analysis. Find the features that are important first and then classify them. So what does this mean in terms of analysis of cannab cannabis? So we can distinguish between now chemovars, whether it's an OG Kush or whatever you want to call it, we can quantitatively say if it's the same as something else, just, just because the grower says it's what it is. Um, trace cannabinoids can be upregulated or downregulated and be statistically significantly different and can they, those may be the things that are con contributing to the differences in the experience of that product. We've identified a potential natural product that really hasn't been seen um, in other cannabis uh, analysis previously. Um, would have to confirm going back using a true authentic standard to ensure that is actually the true hit. You will never, you can never be confident in that what you're seeing is uh, from a library hit uh, or anything like that until you go back and analyze an authentic standard. Um, had some other sesquiterpenoids that we've detected that they're not usually included in most targeted analysis for terpenes that growers and, and LPs request in terms of their analysis. And so these unique chemovars can now be distinguished not by their genotype, but by their chemical signature, which is much more important. Um, it doesn't matter what the genotype is, it's how the user experiences that product. Um, so this may be, be able to be used by, for intellectual property for these licensed producers. This is my strain, this is what it should look like. Uh, strain behavior prediction in terms of health effects and, and um, looking at authenticity testing in terms of labeling. Um, refining the extraction process in terms of LPs. Now not just saying this is what we have, but being able to quantitatively say, has my grow changed? Has my extraction changed? Has any of my processes changed? And you can do that um, without being targeted. And then looking into uh, identifying natural products Therapy design, when we're starting to look at truly, once we're able to do these, these health effects uh, studies and, and, and understand what, what the effect of cannabis is on, on health effects, we can now do this quantitatively, not just um, by guessing at what the, what the, uh, the strains are. 
And this has applications in food authenticity, uh, metabolomic research, and, and these are workflows that have been used in other industries, and there's no reason we can't apply this to cannabis. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the following people from SIEX, um, Diana Tran, Craig Butt, Simon, Casey, Paul, they're my EFAB, EFABers for life. Uh, <laughs> Scott from Phenomenex for always helping with chromatography. Larry Campbell um, and his collaborators, Newer and Scott Hopkins from uh, University of Waterloo for showing those really great slides on eye mobility. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, uh, really, uh, thank you guys for coming out really early in the morning and I will take uh, any questions you may have. Thank you. <laughs>